Okay, so we have spent uh, a goodly chunk of time of talking about the problem and framing up everything. And now we move into the solution. And the solution is growing re resilience and what we've called professional maturation. And it all starts with this quote, if I can get my computer to cooperate. <clears throat> that I stumbled on in 2001 uh, while I was working in New York City and relief efforts there. And this really uh, was one of those profound paradigm shifters for me. Was <clears throat> This was, uh, I discovered this on the CDC's website. I since haven't been able to, to uh, find it again, but um, I know I didn't make this up, and it was clearly uh, clearly on uh, site when I was looking for. Uh, I was principal investigator on a funded study in uh, through the University of uh, South Florida, where I was at the time, and I was looking for some reporting forms and discovered this uh, quote: "Disease is the absence of an effective immune system, not the presence of a toxic environment." <clears throat> and that was pretty profound for me to get my head fully around it. Kind of looking at what that means is that, you know, it's not the coronavirus that is causing disease. And once we have a vaccine for it, it's not a problem anymore. That we work on enhancing individuals' immune system. You haven't heard anybody suggest that we should fumigate the air of the United States of America to combat the coronavirus. <clears throat> um, that it is about enhancing that the way that th that uh, vaccines work is they enhance the immune system to be able to, to either uh, assist your body in killing the bacteria or to stop the virus from replicating. <clears throat> um, and that was profound for me to get in the context of working with compassion fatigue because <clears throat> everything up until then had been kind of focusing on changing the environment. And nobody had really conceptualized what does a, an immune system look like in a healthy, resilient, caregiving professional. And that's something that we spent the past 20 years trying to define and, um, and grow in, helping people to grow the skills so that they are able to, to remain resilient in toxic environments. Um, that is the whole thrust of this course is for you to be healthy in environments that are toxic and all healthcare environments are toxic. And another quote from Viktor Frankl that is helpful in the art, in the kind of conceptualization of where we're headed, stimulus response space. In that space is our power. And what power do we have in that space? We have choice. And when we begin making choices, intentional choices, then we find our growth and our freedom. Um, but what happens when we're in a chronic threat response and we're not regulating that threat, re threat response, we lose choice. We lose the space. <clears throat> that stimuli becomes married with instinctual patterns of self-defense. <clears throat> That if we're perceiving these threats as as real threats, and not being able to discern and not being able to regulate, then what starts happening is that we grow these instinctual, immediately implemented patterns of self defense. You disrespect me, I am aggressive back to you, and it's as sure as uh, you know hitting a knee with a mallet. Um. So what we want to do uh, as we look over the rest of the today's training is that everything that we're doing is designed to widen out that space. 
So you get some choice in there so that you begin to cultivate growth and freedom in your process of professional maturation. That's where we're headed. How do you do that? Well, here's what we found to work really well with the um, development and sustaining of professional resilience. And there are five elements, five antibodies, <clears throat> which uh, hopefully the rest of this course, I have a vaccine prepared for you and it'll only sting a little bit. <clears throat> and, and here's the, um, the formula for that vaccine. Uh, it's self-regulation, intentionality, perceptual maturation, connection and support, self-care and revitalization. Those are the five resilient skills or antibodies that we found that when, when those are implemented in your professional life, you, you diminish your symptoms to a level of comfort and you increase your quality of life to, um, to be able to work in the field and not suffer to do it. So without ado, let's jump in on the very first resilient skill. Take us about an hour to walk through this, and um, I'm going to roll and do it with you. So, this first resilient skill um, is called self-regulation. It is not called mindfulness. It is not called mindf uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction, although those have some evidence for their effectiveness. <clears throat> but what we're doing is not mindfulness. Um, it is something akin to but different from mindfulness. So when you say this just mindfulness, then you would be wrong. <clears throat> but what it is, is in, it's the use of interoception and acute relaxation. And that is what self-regulation. So the, the purpose of the skill is to learn to intentionally interrupt your threat response and getting that initially up to triple digits, up to 100 times a day, doing that 100 times a day. So there's two agenda that I have to do with you in the next hour. Two things to accomplish. Anytime I teach somebody or a group of somebodies to self-regulate, I've got two things I'm trying to get done during that time. And, and thing one is to have you conceptualize what it is, what self-regulation is. And, and that you got a really good understanding, a really good conceptualization of it. And two, is that sometime in the 30 minutes that I'm walking through skills development with you, is that you have at least once for at least a second or two, the felt sense of being in a body that is relaxed and that we can anchor that moment in time so that you feel what it feels like to be in a body that's relaxed so that you can go replicate that in future situations and you can that skill becomes portable out of my office or out of the training into your life. So I'm going to do those two things with you right now, hopefully. And I start that process by saying this. Self-regulation is relaxation. But relaxation is not self-regulation. What's that mean? Well, what it means is that most of the technology that we have in the field of mental health to help people to get relaxed, guided visualization, progressive muscle relaxation, autogenics, diaphragmatic breathing, all of those relaxation skills require dissociating from the activities of daily living to achieve the relaxation response. The person has to take a break to go engage the skill for for a minute or two up to 20 or 30 minutes if they're using meditation, which is great. It's great to do that. And the, the, the more that folks have a, a regular practice of relaxation, whether that's meditation or progressive muscle relaxation or any other tools, yoga, that they use for getting more profound relaxation, they're going to do self-regulation better. But it ain't the same thing. 
Self-regulation, the converse to relaxation, is the ability to interrupt the threat response just enough to get out of the sympathetic, out of sympathetic dominance while remaining fully engaged in the activities of daily living. It's not taking a break. It is the ability to discover that you're having a threat response and then intervene with it, to interrupt it, all within a two-second window. So there's no break. It's, it's while you're in the game. It's staying in the game and developing the skill so that you can monitor and discover that you're having a threat response and then intervene to interrupt it and then going on to the next activity and the ability to move back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth all day long so that you are consistently interrupting that threat response in multitude of situations and not ever letting your, your sympathetic nervous system become dominant. It's, it's jacking up there because you're perceiving threat all day, but you are continuing to interrupt it. So it looks like that rather than like that which people who are, have compassion fatigue, they're in their threat response all day long. What we're going to teach them to do is to begin to interrupt that. It comes back on, it comes back up, and then interrupt it again and again and again and again. And that's what self-regulation looks like. <sighs> now, in kind of articulating and talking about self-regulation, I always use um, Yerkes Dotson. Uh, the Yerkes Dotson law and this Yerkes Dotson um, curve to to talk about self regulation, and what this this shows us. And as I said, uh, Yerkes Dotson Y E R K E S hyphen D O D S O N. It was originally published in 1908 with rat studies. Um, this is a public domain. Um, picture here so it I mean it's old but it's still it, it's the same it's the same curve it's the same law um it is now the yerkes dotson law it's been the subject of i mean thousands of of empirical studies and what it shows us is the relationship over here on the y-axis the vertical axis with performance cognitive and motor performance low performance down here high performance over here cognitive and motor on the x-axis, on the horizontal axis, we have arousal. How much energy is in the body? Low energy in the body, high energy in the body. And what you see here is that with no energy, you got no performance. You're not, you're not able to do your taxes or run very fast while you're sleeping. Um, you could not do uh, division of, you know, a, a, a two, four, you know, divide uh, 4,027 into 22. You probably couldn't do that 10 seconds after waking up from sleeping. You, what? And not even be able to focus your attention. You probably don't run very fast 10 seconds after waking up from sleep. But... 15 minutes after waking up from sleeping and maybe with the help of a cup of coffee, adding energy to the body, then you reach maximal functioning and you could do that division even without a calculator. You, you know, you could, you could work all that out. You could, you, you probably run about as fast as you could ever run 15 minutes after waking up. But look at what happens, you know, and what, what's gone here is the pathway from from no performance to maximal performance is by if a body is completely and totally with no energy, as you add energy, you improve performance. But look at what happens once you get up here to maximal functioning. And look at what happens if you keep adding energy, which is what sympathetic dominance is. It's continuing, continuous adding of energy. Then we got a problem because you're starting to see Everything's falling off over here, that we're losing capacity and becoming increasingly symptomatic, increasingly exhausted, sick, and shut down is where that leads to. Um, and some of my clients, <coughs> they spend all day long over here on the right-hand side of Yerkes Dotson. And over on the right-hand side is... Um, <coughs> 
is like living at 25,000 feet, <clears throat> that you're actively dying. Your body's actually killing itself at that level of arousal. <clears throat> so first important part here is this, the take-home message of this. The more important the task is to you and the more important it is for you to do a good job with that task, the more important it is for you to enter that task with down-regulated, low-intensity energy in your body and continuing to dial down the arousal. Because our instinctual response for most of us, when we're approaching something that's a high demand that we perceive as threatening, what do we do? I want to do a good job. I want to do a good job. I want to do a good job. The energy level's cranking up. And what happens is we enter that task somewhere over here, and then it just drops off more and more and more, and you find yourself diminished. How many of you have ever studied for an exam, knew the material for the exam, actually had flashcards with that material on it, and you set for the exam, and oh, it's blank. You're not able to call it up, even though you know you studied it and you couldn't access it. Uh, most of us have had that experience. If you're a performer, an athlete, how many of you have done a really good job in rehearsal or at practice, and then you go to the field or you go to the stage and you find yourself it, functioning on stage or in the game at a whole lot less capacity than you were doing during practice? That's you on the right-hand side of Yerkes Dotson. That is you being so jacked up that you temporarily lost motor or cognitive skills to be able to engage whatever task it is that you're doing. So um, what happened, it, it, there was a dude in the late 60s and early 70s named Hans Selye, who was a Norwegian-Canadian researcher, stress researcher, and he really kind of brought stress to the forefront and started talking about it as a thing, um, and kind of the conceptualization of stress that we have today is thanks to Hans Selye. And what Hans Selye did was he put this line here in the middle of Yerkes Dotson. And what he said was everything to the right-hand side of the line is distress, and, and, and everything to the left-hand side he called eustress. Distress over here, eustress over here. And what's the difference? Well, sometimes folks say performance, and I go, well, hold up on that. Look here. You got somebody over here and here, same level of performance, but completely different experiences. What's different about performing at this level of cognitive or motor skills here versus over here? Well, can you see over here it generates symptoms? Over here, it's costing you. But over here, it is not costing you. That you're comfortable in your body, that you're functioning well at 80% or better, and there is no damage done to your body and you're not in you're not struggling to do the task. You're comfortable. That's the difference. That's the difference between you stress is empowered, functioning, um, not diminishing in your capacity. And over here that you it's unsustainable, that it's it's uh, it's brute force. It's grinding through everything adding more energy to a system that is already overcharged. And that's what most folks use to navigate through their workday until they learn what, what we've been sharing this morning, is that until you learn that there's not very much really dangerous in your work and that I need to regulate my system rather than fight my way through it so I can get to that, that Jack Daniels or that 3,000 calories at, at Dairy Queen or, you know, whatever else to soothe the discomfort that I've been in all day long, which is what happens when you live over here, then you do self-destructive ways to soothe the discomfort that you've been in all day long to make it through the day. And you end up in this whipsaw kind of back and forth of where you're killing yourself on both ends. So simple definition of what the two factors are with self-regulation, this is a big bottle of water, is A, catching ourselves, 
on the right-hand side of your accused dots that were over there, that we got too much energy in our body. And then B, doing something to get back over to the left-hand side, all within a two-second window. So catching ourselves and then intervening with ourselves so we're back over there, all in two seconds. So I already did this with you. These are the, um, this is empirical, what I was saying to you, is that the, the more difficult the task, like let that be washing dishes and this is uh, running a code at a hospital or uh, having a client who is suicidal, um, you know, any of those real high demand situations. And what it shows is that, you know, with these low demand situations, low difficulty, washing the dishes, you can be pretty stressed out. A lot of energy in your body and still have competence washing the dishes. You don't lose your competence. But the more difficult, more perceivably difficult, the more important the task is to you, then what happens is that you see significantly less uh, arousal before we are already up here to the summit and starting our way down. So same level of energy for washing dishes with, you know, suicidal client is we're over here and we're in diminished functioning and generating symptoms. So how important, extra double important it is for those high demand situations to be in in uh, down-regulated systems. So let me back up and, and let me spend a second talking about this word, interoception. So the two component, two primary components of self-regulation are neuroception and interoception. Neuroception is brain to body. I am not really in danger, so therefore do not need a threat response. <sighs> There's an automatic release that comes with that. Um, but with diminished brain functioning, it's often hard to be able to get the neuroception. So we have to go to interoception. And what is interoception? Interoception is the felt sense real-time awareness of your body's processes. It is the ability to feel your body. Not think about your body, but to put your attention in it. So, um... Put your attention right now on my big nose. Focus on that for the next five seconds. You guys were all effectively able to focus on my nose, weren't you? Now, focus on your abdominal muscles. Notice what your abdominal muscles are doing right now. Just keep your attention on those abdominal muscles for five seconds. Focus on that is interoception, is your ability to put your cursor of awareness. You were able to perfectly put your cursor of awareness on my nose, and we're really good at that with doing environmental stuff. If I want to focus on what's the sign saying while I'm driving by, uh, what's that person doing over there in that yard, we can focus on all that stuff. But what, we're, what we need to develop if we want to self-regulate well is we need to be able to start start focusing, which a lot of us have never done before, but we need to start focusing on what's going on in our body, putting our attention in our body. That's part A. That's how you discover, let me take all this stuff off of here, and then pop that back up. Oh, it just told me that it took it off. Let's try that again. Grumble. I'm not having a good day with the technological stuff. Usually when you come out of uh, a presenter view, it gives you the opportunity, do you want to keep or release the um, all of the uh, graphics that you put on there? And it... Let's see if it resets. Nope. It's, it's not letting me do it. Okay, well, fine. <sighs> if I relax my body, I get all of my resilience, and it turns out, you know what? 
There is no danger in PowerPoint not working the way I want it to work, even though I perceive it as a threat. <sighs> so let me regain comfort in my body and regain uh, uh, neocortical functioning and my language skills and walk through this. <clears throat> so there's a lot of ways to discover yourself over here. If you've got uh, monitoring devices, uh, an Apple Watch, uh, I've seen this new thing on Facebook. Some of you have probably seen it. It's called an R ring and almost bought one, but I decided I have I decided not to do it yet. Uh, that, that monitors lots of stuff, heart rate, heart rate variability, uh, respiration rate, you know, all of those things. You can you can get that you're over here. You can discover that you're having a threat response by lots of different physiological uh, mechanisms. You can you could test cortisol levels. Um, you could monitor respiration rate um, that, you know, 12, maybe it's 12 breaths a minute is, is resting respiration and 14 or 15 breaths a minute when you're, when you're over here or heart rate and, you know, 70, 65, 70 beats a minute at rest and 90, 85, 90 when you're having, um, when you're having a, a, a threat response. But it's hard to tell the difference in that just in, in a two second period of time. How do you tell? You gotta take your pulse and you gotta count them. You gotta start to kind of do that at least for 10 seconds to be able to get heart rate. Well, we wanna do this in two seconds, so it's not very efficient. You can use, a, you could set your Apple Watch to alarm when it gets to 90 beats a minute, the haptics go off and you recognize, yeah, you could do it that way. Uh, but you still are dependent upon an external device. To do this organically, what we use is interoception. And what, how would you know that you are having a threat response? What system in your body would best tell you that? Well, that's your muscles. And if, you just, if you're able to discover muscles in your body constricted, then you have discovered that you're having a threat response. That's how you know. And so... Once you discover the muscles that are, are constricted, and let me just tell you how important that is. What I just said is how important and, and why we do that is because of Joseph Ledoux. Um, he is kind of the god of the human threat response research. Uh, masterwork. In two, I always get the dates confused. 2013 or 2015, he wrote a book called Anxious, which is the Bible for understanding the human threat response. Um, everybody who writes about this stuff quotes him. Um, and, uh, what he's discovered is that human beings have two different circuitries of threat response. And he calls it the high road and the low road. And the high road, um, bunch of different brain structures, and he maps it all out in his book. I'm not going to go through all of them. Uh, but it goes through the frontal lobe. And because it goes through the frontal lobe, uh, both, efferent and afferent going and coming um, that it lets, we feel it, we know it, we're aware of it. And he calls that fear. That's what fear is. He says, but that most human beings threat response takes the low road, subcortical, meaning the sensory memory intrudes, threat response activated, and it all stays subcortical. It never gets to the frontal lobe. What's that mean? What that means is that most of us, most of you who are watching this, and certainly myself, are having threat responses mostly all day long that we are unaware that we're having, completely dissociated and, and unconscious. It's happening, and we're... Our bodies are in distress. We just don't know it. We are dissociated. So in order to grow this skill, mature as a healthcare professional, and discover that we're having threat response, is that we got to go sniff it out. You got to go look for it. And how do you look for it? You scan your body. And when you discover muscles that are constricted, unless you got lockjaw, then the reason why those muscles are, are constricted is because you're perceiving a threat. And how do you interrupt it? How do you get from there to the other side in two seconds? Well, that's pretty simple, too. You just stop squeezing those muscles. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a great workshop. <laughs>
I mean, ultimately, it is that simple. But man, it ain't that easy. It's a lifelong process. It's a lifelong practice of monitoring and intentionally taking your attention off of, you know, what Lao Tzu, the founder of uh, Taoism, said that called the 10,000 things all vying for our attention. Taking it off of my own thoughts, taking my attention off of the environment and putting for a second my attention in my body and scanning my body and discovering that I am having all kinds of muscle constriction in there that the second before I had no awareness because all my attention was on you and the slides and, you know, all of this mapping of what, what am I going to say next and how am I going to do that? All of that stuff's going on. I'm not paying attention to my body because I'm all caught up in this stuff. But once I pay attention to my body, because I've had painful learning with all this stuff, then I'm in a threat response. Oh my goodness. Look at that. All the muscles in my abdomen and my pelvis and my legs and my feet even are constricted. And now that I've discovered I'm having a threat response, check it out. I can interrupt it, but I can't interrupt it if I don't know I'm having it. So that's why this skill of interoception becomes essential for self-regulation. And it's why I have eschewed mindfulness because there are a few mindfulness practices that teach interoception and use body awareness as a component of mindfulness, but there's a lot of mindfulness out there that just stays cognitive and environmentally focused and not developing the skill of interoception. And if you're not developing the skill of interoception, then there is a whole lot of threat responses that are passing you by that all the mindfulness is helping you to do is become better at dissociating your awareness away from it. And that is not resolution. That's just better dissociation. So we want to help you to be able to discover that you're having it and then being able to interrupt it all in a two second window. And it's at this point <coughs> that I say to the audience when I'm doing a, a, a day-long training, or I say to my client when I'm doing individual therapy, I look them in the eye and I say, um, you know, I perceive you as a threat. And my clients go, I'll get a little bit in What do you mean? I'm, I'm not doing anything. How, how am I a threat to you? I, I'm 5'2", 120 pounds. You're 6'3", 240 pounds. That... How am I a threat to you? And, you know, I chuckle and I say, well, it's not really you. The audience, same thing. I perceive, you know, I look at the audience and I say, I perceive all of you in this room right now as a threat. Am I in danger? No. So why do human beings perceive threat where there's no danger? There's only one reason. And so always the same reason. It's because of painful past learning intruding into the perceptual system here in the present is how much painful learning have I had sitting across from a client? How much painful learning have I had standing in front of an audience? Lots. And it's a exactly similar uh, sensory situation. So all of that painful learning is intruding, mostly on the low road. So I'm not aware of it unless I focus on it. But it's happening the whole time that I'm standing in front of an audience, the whole time that I am working with a client, is that that threat response is active. And if I'm not doing interoception that I'm not aware of. it. <clears throat> so here's what that looks like. I'm looking at that camera right now, i.e. you in the eye. And I am perceiving, even though I don't see you and don't know where you are watching this, I am perceiving your judgment of me as a threat. Why? Not because of you and not because I'm in danger, but I've had a lot of experiences of painful learning, of getting, you know, bad evaluations and people upset with me. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of history back there of painful stuff. So right now, all of my attention is focused on you 100%. But right now, you don't know that I'm not paying attention to you. I have no, except just ghosty peripheral awareness of that camera up there. My attention's on my body. And what I'm doing is I'm starting here at my head and I'm scanning down very quickly and I'm discovering all just about every muscle group down the middle of my body my here at the my diaphragm my abdomen 
my pelvis, my butt, my legs are all tight because I'm perceiving a threat, and that's what muscles do. And now I'm whoop, interrupting them, comfortable body, restore neocortical functioning, and then my attention back to you and the next activity. is boop, 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 boop. In two seconds, I discovered threat response, and I interrupted it. And then I go on to the next thing, you know, talk for a few minutes, do, 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 whatever I'm doing. And then, you know, I look at you again and I do the same thing. Attention on you, break my attention away, even though I'm not breaking eye contact, but I'm breaking my attention and putting my attention on my body for a second. And I discover those muscles are all nice and comfortable and relaxed, right? Right? No. <laughs> They're all constricted again. I'm tightened right back up. Why? Shouldn't I just be able to set it and forget it and stay relaxed? That would be ideal. We wouldn't be having this workshop if we could. But what's not changed? Camera's still there. I'm still here. My learning history is still my learning history. So I'm still perceiving a threat in this situation. Now, what I am doing is every time that I am relaxing my body, I'm doing exposure pairing with relaxation. And I'm desensitizing it a little bit more and a little bit more, but it's still happening. So I still have to practice the self-regulation. And, you know, what's going on in my body is my sympathetic nervous system is activated. And my sympathetic nervous system, Krishnamurti said, we're both the beast and its rider. I love that. So, you know, I'm the rider of my beast, Eric the human part of me, and, and then there is the beast part of me. There's the meat. And the meat is, you know, got millions of years of evolution in the animal kingdom. And so my beast wants me to kill you, wants me to rip that camera, tear up that computer system, or say, later, folks, I've had enough of this. I'm going to go ride my Ducati. It's a beautiful day. <laughs> um, but Eric wants something different than his beast. Eric wants to teach you something, wants to kind of leave this legacy, get this information out there so that, you know, you and hopefully hundreds and thousands of people get to work with as care professionals and not suffer from doing it. So you have greater longevity, better quality of life, and we evolve the field and we evolve the people in it. That I want to perform my mission. And what I did for uh, better than 15 years of my career was that I took that beast and I just, I just manhandled it. I wrapped my hands around its throat and I forced it into all of those situations, pre preventing it from eating anybody and not letting it run away as I muscled my way through every single professional activity of that day. Yeah. yeah. It's just a shiver, shudder as I think back to those days because it damn near killed me. I lost a marriage. I got sick physically. I got sick emotionally. Um, I had five years clean and relapsed. Um, just every, it, it, it made my life hell. Now, here's the bad thing about that is I was professionally competent. <laughs> While my life was falling apart. Because I was so afraid of not being seen as professionally competent, I let everything else fall apart. And that was all scary. And I just muscled my way through everything. Phew. And I survived it. Thank God. Truly, thank God. Today, what I've discovered is that if I keep soothing that beast, <laughs> then the beast just sleeps all day. And now Eric gets to intend his way through the day. I don't have to force anything. Relax, body. I can just go from this thing to the next thing to the next thing. Not having to use any exertion to do those activities. And what that means for me is I get done with a day of work and I still have energy and, and 
initiative. Those are two different things. And the initiative to engage a life outside of work, to make my life satisfying out there. And that's pretty wonderful. It's a pretty great place to get after having been where I've been. It's a miracle. My hope is that you discover it also. So there is part one done. Now, on to part two. I want to take the next 15 or 20 minutes and do some skills building with you around some things that we found that work pretty well for self-regulation. Again, it's not relaxation. So PMR, not such a good thing. Progressive muscle relaxation. Or uh, diaphragmatic breathing is not really very good either. Uh, breathing's good for people that already have a breathing practice, but for trying to start it, trying to use breathing as the front end for self-regulation, you know, it takes three or four regulated breaths before a person starts getting a, a, a relaxation response. And that's, you know, that's eight or 10 or 15 seconds of disengagement. So it's hard to stay in the game using diaphragmatic breathing as a self-regulatory tool. But for those that already have it, it works pretty well, who've been practicing it already. So we've done the, hopefully you've got a good conceptualization of it now. Now what I want to do of what it is, it is the ability to break my attention away from, from the environment and my thoughts, put my attention in my body, discover I'm having a threat response, release the tension in those muscles, and then return my attention back to the next task. That's self-regulation. Get that up to 100 times a day, and you don't have stress symptoms anymore. You still have peaks of where you're uncomfortable, and you interrupt that, and bloop, you don't hang out long enough for that to turn into all of those symptoms of stress, where, you, where you're going into a, um, a, a full-on panic attack, and that you're de-skilled, or that you are having a headache, or that you are uh, diminished in your functioning. You're, you're asymptomatic. Get it up to 200 times a day and you're optimizing your life. You're working better and more efficiently than you ever have in your life. How free you want to be. So now is the second half, which is to create the opportunity uh, with my individual clients. Opportunity is the wrong word. To create the experience with my client or with an audience or group of people that I'm working with and hopefully with you watching this personally of having the experience, even if it's just for one second, of what it feels like to be in a body that's comfortable. Because once you get it and you feel it, then you can do it, you can replicate it over and over again. So that I need to create that experience with my clients so that then, then I know that they are empowered with that skill and they can now go put it into practice in their lives. So I start the second half with this statement. If you would have seen me teach this 15 years ago, I was a fascist. I would have told you there is only one right way to do self-regulation. My way. 15 years later, it turns out I was right. There's only one right way to do self-regulation. Your way. Not my way. Ah, that's called humility. And there is two ways to get to humility. One is by being humble, and the other one's getting humiliated. Guess which path I got to? <laughs> guess what path I took to get to humility? Yeah, not by being humble. <clears throat> but I am now a little bit better. So here's what I say today: there is no right way to do self-regulation. However you are discovering, whenever you are discovering muscles in your body that are constricted and you are intentionally releasing those muscles, you are practicing self-regulation. Neck muscles, shoulder muscles, feet muscles, butt muscles, thigh muscles, abdominal muscles, chest muscles, finger muscles, any muscles in your body that you discover in real time are constricted and you are releasing the constriction of those muscles, then you are practicing self-regulation. The more you do it, the better you know your body. So, you know, you do it one time, 
you know, you hold tension in the muscles of your shoulder and you feel them tight and you become aware of it and you release the tension in your shoulders, you feel better. Cool. That's nice. And then when you get that up to the, when you've done it for the 25th time or the 32nd time in a day, what starts happening is you're going, oh, you know what? My back muscles are not only my traps, but, but these muscles in the middle of my back, they're tight too. Let me release those also. Oh, that feels good. And then on to the next activity. And then the 52nd time you do it, you start going, oh, these chest muscles are tight. Let me release those. And you start making friends with your body. You're living more and more of your time in interoception. So you're becoming aware of a landscape that you didn't know before. And I don't really have time to go into it, but little boys and little girls who grew up with anxious parents and, you know, just, just anxious that were good parents, but anxious. But those of us that grew up with caregivers that were violent or aggressive or exploitive, then it's even worse. What, what happened for those little boys and little girls that grew up with, with anxious caregivers or hurtful or exploitive caregivers is that we grew, spent most of our childhoods in bodies that were constricted tight. And we didn't have any analgesia. Couldn't get our hands on Jack Daniels at, at four years old, most of us. Couldn't have food at will. You know, didn't have other methods for being able to soothe the discomfort that we were in. It was pain. It's chronic pain. So what do little boys and little girls learn to do? Is they learn to dissociate their awareness out of their bodies. So most of us have learned to live most of our day in what's called somatic dissociation, that we don't feel our bodies most of the day. And what you start discovering is that when you're not feeling it, when you're not aware of it, it's constricted. And as you become aware, you go, oh my God, how long have those been tight? Probably a while because they hurt. <sighs> and the more that you do that, the more that you are healing, resolving all of this pain from the past and optimizing your function here in the present. That's forward-facing work that, I, that I've uh, trademarked. So, again, there is no right way to do it. Any group of muscles that you are becoming aware of and you're able to release it, when you get that up, when you get that number up to 100 times a day, if it's just your shoulders and you're doing that 100 times a day, then what you're doing is that you've interrupted that threat response 100 times a day and your quality of life has significantly improved. That's the way that works. Now, I start with that and then what I do is I kind of throw out a smorgasbord. I got a few here, um, and then I'll, the couple that I don't have written down that I'll show you. I kind of give a set of skills that are short and sweet methods for self-regulation, and I say, try these on and see which works best for you. Practice them over the next week. See which see which works is most useful for you, and then you can keep doing that one or try other ones. So, however you're doing it, there's no right way. So let me just run through a few of these with you and see which work better for you. And one that I've been using for 20 years <laughs> that uh, people who have you know been following my work for a whole lot of years have uh, turned wet noodle into a verb. And I get emails of people telling me how they wet noodle their way through an argument with their spouse or they wet noodle their way through their doctoral defense or, you know, whatever else. The, the wet noodling is the, is the verb of how they're navigating through it, which is cute. But, um, and wet noodle is not a good name for the skill because it, it kind of like, Makes you, at least my, the visual in my head of wet noodles like is is boneless chicken, you know, just kind of completely flopped out. But that's not what wet noodle is. What we're going to do with the wet noodle is what I'm going to what I'm going to ask you to to experience is ten seconds of scanning from your head to your toes, imagining that there is this horizontal plane of awareness moving downward in your body, 
from your head to your toes in 10 seconds. And as that plane moves downward, any group of muscles that it comes across as it's moving downward, I want you to just release the tension in those muscles, moving all the way down your body from your head to your toe, 10 seconds, I'll count the 10 count, and you notice what you notice those muscles and release them for 10 seconds. Ready, begin. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. When I do this in a room full of folks, I, after they look up, you know, I look around the room and I say, how stressed out are you right now? And they go, I'm not. How about you? A one. Okay. Cool. It worked. And I say, you know, I do that with my clients. My clients say BFD. And I say, you bet you it's a BFD. And let me show you what a big deal it is. And the, when, again, with an audience, I say, what percentage, and w w can I please see a show of hands of all of you that at any time during those 10 seconds of the wet noodle were able to experience at least one of those seconds you were in a comfortable body? Sometime during those 10 seconds. And I get 90% of the hands. Uh, no matter what country I do this in, all over the world, um, that, that I get 90% of the people raising their hand. And what I say is those of you who are raising your hand, what you've just demonstrated is that you have all the skills that you need to be able to never experience stress again for the rest of your life. You just demonstrated that you have the skill to yourself and to me. But what nobody's ever done with or for you in your history has been to invite you, support you, and coach you in your process of pairing that skill of releasing the tension of the muscles of your body with the high demand context in your life, like work, like seeing a client, like driving in traffic, like being in conflict with your spouse, like disciplining issues with your children. You've walked into those situations, space between the perceive the situation as a threat, the space collapses, and you're into an instinctual aggression or avoidance behavior. What I'm going to ask you to do is to start to over the next week is to begin to confront those situations and get some space between stimulus and response. Relax the muscles of your body while you're walking into that and come back next week and report to me how things changed, how they were different. That's the way I do psychotherapy today. That's also the way that I do professional resilience, that I coach professional resilience. Go to work the next week and watch how many times that you are perceiving threat and bring your body into relaxation and notice how it changes things Notice how you feel different. Notice how you act different. Notice how you think different. Come back and report that to me. And it's profound, the shifts that happen. Not in distress. Think clearly. Act with integrity. Consistently. Every single person that does it. That's what I hear. So another skill that I teach, this one's up. Uh, is going to be a, a stand-in for diaphragmatic breathing, um, as I already talked about that one. This one, I like this one a little bit better. It's just kind of cuter and easier and simpler. Um, I ask my clients, I, I say to them, and I'll say to you, you have a muscular system and you have a skeletal system. What's the difference? And you'd be surprised how many advanced degree folks struggle to get that quantified. Uh, well, one's bones and one's muscles. I go, yeah, nice. Uh, what's the difference? And uh, you'd be also surprised with how many people get this wrong, the, the answer to this question wrong, advanced degree professionals. I say, um, which one of those systems are responsible for supporting your body? And you'd be surprised at how many of them say muscles. And I go, no, your muscles are not there for support. They're there for locomotion. That's what they do. What supports you? Your skeletal system. Hundreds of millions of years of evolution. Your skeletal system is built perfectly to support your body's weight. You do not need any uh, uh, chronically constricted muscles to support your body. 
You need occasionally constricted muscles to realign and keep yourself from falling over and, and being a boneless chicken. Uh, but you, it, it's only about balance. It's, it's locomotion. It's reestablishing balance. So <laughs> what I'm going to ask you to do is to see if you, we can use those two systems rightly. And I'm going to ask you for the next 10 seconds to trust your skeleton with the support of your weight. So you're going to surrender your body, your body support to your skeleton while you let the muscles go. You don't need to have any of them tight. So you're going to sit in the seat and put the weight there on your sit bones. Uh, and you got to trust the chair too, or wherever you're sitting. Um, but it's done a fine job now for four or five hours. It'll probably continue to work. Um, and then you put your weight on those sit bones and a little bit on, on the uh, femur, I think that is. A um, little bit, but not much. Um, and then you're going to line up your spine, which takes care of all this middle stuff. It, it's, it holds the rib cage, and the rib cage holds all of that stuff. It's all perfectly integrated very nicely. Uh, line up your cervical spine that holds the weight of your head, and then you're just going to spend 10 seconds of continuing to surrender over to your skeletal system, support your weight. Just letting go and surrendering into that. So take 10 seconds to trust your skeletal system for the support of your weight. Ready, go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. If that's useful, take it with you. If not, leave it here. I think I have seven of these techniques uh, that I have all of have all of them on the um, uh, videos on the um, on my resources on the website. But so I don't get uh, backed up against the clock on this this course. I'm, I'm going to do uh, I'm going to do two actually three or four more with you, but they're all in tandem with the, three of them are in the tandem with the last one. Um. But this is one that, this next one is a skill that I use for, for people that don't have very good interoception. And it's a cool skill that will work for people that don't, that are struggling with feeling their body, struggling with the felt sense of the muscles in their body. So this is a way to get muscle relaxation um, and parasympathetic nervous system activation um, with effort instead of surrender. Uh, and a lot of alpha folks I work with regu uh, uh, relegate themselves to this technique more than any of the other ones. I work a lot with emergency physicians and this is the technique that, that the ones that, that start practicing self-regulation, this is the one they use more than any other ones. So, um, let me teach it to you. <laughs> this comes from, I mentioned a name a little earlier, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Dave Grossman. He's uh, ex-commander of the United States Special Forces. He's written two books. Uh, one of them is, the first one was called On Killing. Really interesting book. I think that that was in the, the um, mid-90s. And it was an exploration of what it takes for somebody to kill another person. And it's intriguing. And, you know, what he discovered is that the reason why soldiers kill is not anger, not defense of their country. It is for the person beside them. It is to make sure that this person that they have they care a whole lot about is safe. And there's just something that's that's um that's kind of a moving thing for me. Um and you know he talks about in his second book, which is called On Combat, about how important it is, if you're going to be in combat, that you be in a parasympathetically dominant, down regulated autonomic nervous system, unless you kill yourself or your squad mates in a sympathetic system. And it is a whole lot more palatable for people who are warriors 
law enforcement officers, combat veterans, to hear that from another warrior than it is from a mental health professional. It just doesn't make sense for, like, I don't have any cred to be able to talk in that world. Um, but he does. And that book resonates really well with a lot of, uh, a lot of my clients that have that history. And he talks about it in the book that there's a skill that they teach um, special forces, men and women, in their training programs to better target weapons. And in targeting a weapon, any of you have ever targeted a firearm at a target, you know that you need to be in a relaxed body if you want to hit the target. That, that constriction, anxiety, what that does is that produces micro movements here that make you yards off target downrange. And the better that you're able to relax the muscles of your body, use the skeletal system to support the weapon, the better chance you have of hitting the target down there. And what they do to teach special forces is they, they shoot a lot. One thing, they shoot more than anybody else. I think it's uh, a thousand rounds a week that they are, is kind of the average uh, shots they take. That's a lot, that's a lot of shooting. <clears throat> so they're really good at it in lot, all kinds of different conditions. So it becomes an integrated unconscious skill that, that it becomes, uh, those of you who've ever heard of proprioception, that's what shooting becomes for special forces, men and women, is it becomes proprioceptive. That means that's like um, this ability to be able to to feel space and 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 that that's uh, a, a pro that you don't need sensory that you can feel it. It's a, uh, if you stand on the side of a of a uh, um, curtain and you can you bring your fingers together. It, it's pro that's proprioception and that's what that becomes. But for those that are doing other things, this is a skill that they use. If somebody's uh, a special forces men or women. Uh, men and women are doing something else and they have to transition from something else into combat with a weapon, then this is a quick, easy skill to be able to maximize relaxation in a short amount of time um, to get better targeting. And what they teach them to do is to attend to peripheral vision before looking into the eye scope, kind of like a palate cleanser, you know, when you're having dinner that the peripheral vision is a way to interrupt the threat response so that now they can engage in, um, in combat much better skill. And um, think about how this works. If you, anytime that you've been in any altercations or any where there's been um, heightened emotions, conflict between you and another person, where's all your attention focused? <sighs> It's always out there. I mean, your your visual attention. What we're we've evolved to do is to focus what, on whatever the threat is, and it's hyper focus. I've worked with a lot of of, of um, law enforcement officers post shooting, and they describe that it's like a big black tunnel when a weapon's pointed at them. That they only are aware of the barrel of that weapon. That's the only thing they have is it just becomes very tunnel vision, very constricted vision hyper-focused on that thing, which is what in a sympathetic nervous system it does to your vision, is that it, and it's evolutional. That's a, that's a good tool that you focus completely on what's dangerous. But the cost of focusing on what's dangerous is that the energy is continuing to raise up. So how do you interrupt that raising of the energy um, so that you, you drop it back down and that you stay in the realm of maximal capacity instead of going over onto the right-hand side of Yerkes Dotson where you lose that skill. How do you do that? Well, peripheral vision is one of the ways. Um, because when you widen your... You can only have peripheral vision if you are parasympathetic. So what, what focusing on the periphery does is that it forces your system out of the threat response into peripheral vision. It's a muscle, muscular kind of mm, this way of interrupting the threat response. So let me show you how that works. I'm going to ask you to focus on some dot straight ahead. It may be something on the screen. It may be something beyond that, but something in the near distance that's at eye level or 10 degrees above. And focus on that dot and just focus on it 
very intensely for five seconds. Now, for the next five seconds, soften your focus on that dot so that dot starts to get a little bit blurry. Now, put your fingers out here at about 70 degrees on both sides of your face. Now, with your eyes still looking forward exactly as they were before, but no longer are you paying attention to that dot, now your right eye is paying attention to what's out here in the right periphery, while your left eye simultaneously is paying attention to what's out in the left periphery. And now your attention is out here in your periphery. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to count to 10, and I'm going to ask you to push your peripheral awareness back as far towards 180 degrees as you can get it without moving your eyes. You're keeping your eyes fixated forward, but you're keeping your awareness out here. And I still have awareness here. I can still see these fingers back to here. And it's where, here I'm about to lose it. But that's pretty close to 180 degrees. That looks about 175, 170, 175 degrees that I have awareness. Now, what I'm going to ask you to do is either with your fingers up here and you can push your fingers back, or you can just do that with the intention of focusing your awareness out to the side and pushing it back as far as you can towards 180 degrees. I'm going to ask you to, while I count a 10 count, notice what happens in your body while you are becoming more and more peripherally aware. What's happening with those muscles in the body? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. If that's useful, take it with you. If not, leave it here. So um, <clears throat> one more skill that is really going to turn into three more skills. Um, this is uh, the one I want to do with you next is uh, the one that I've always been a fascist about. While there is no right way to do this uh, self-regulation, I truly believe that this next thing I'm going to show you is the best way. Um, and I've been teaching folks to do this for 23 years. Um, and it's, it's pelvic relaxation. And there's lots of, of reasons why and how that works. It has mostly to do with the vagus nerve, which I'm not going to go into today. But I am going to ask that you experience it. I've written about it in a lot of different places. And, um, and see what happens in your body while, while you're practicing this. So to discover this method, what I'm going to ask you to do is to hold your hands out, palms up. And if you're, it, it, you need to be sitting to do this. And I'm going to ask you to put your hands under your butt and feel the two bones that you're sitting on. Those are called the ischial tuberosities. They're kind of your sit bones. Um, if you're like me, you got junk in the trunk. you got to kind of dig up in there and, and, and find them. Uh, push up into, you know, those to find those bones and touch them solidly. And once you've touched those two bones solidly, then go ahead and take your hands out. Now, next, touch here your, your hip pelvic bones that stick out there on the side. Um, some of us have to dig in to find those, too. And what you just did is that you have made a touch memory in your body for four points. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. So I'm going to ask you to find those four points in your body. Uh, interoceptively, not cognitively, but that you're taking your awareness down into your body and feeling the lingering sensation of where you've just touched those four points on your bones. If, you, if you're not feeling it, then touch, touch all four of those points again. Two sit bones, two hip and pelvic bones. Touch them again and then release. Now you should have the lingering sensation of where you just touched it and you can feel those four points in your body. Once you got that, what I'm going to ask you to do is to imagine connecting all four of those dots with a straight line. So you end up with a quadrangle thing, something that's squarish. Um, uh, mostly square for most people. It may be a little bit elongated. Uh, a little bit less than all four equal sides, but it's 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 squarish. 
And when you think about the where, the angle that that, uh, that that square thing has in your body is it sits in your body about a 45 degree angle, whether you're sitting or whether you're standing, kind of like this, where it's open on the, the top of this is at the top of your pelvis here, and then it, it diagonals back to those bones on the bottom. And when you think about <coughs> where that is in the body, it is kind of right along this area, along the, uh, uh, it's in the middle of the pelvis. All the muscles of the pelvis go down the middle of that, of that square. They're, they're right in the middle of it. So what I'm going to ask you to do is for the next 20 seconds is I'm going to ask you to allow that square to expand outward so that there is no clenching of any of the muscles in the middle of that square. You're just going to completely soften that whole area of the body, letting it go. For 10 more seconds, focusing on that, that center of that square, the core muscles, releasing and softening and opening those muscles, just completely letting them go. Congratulations. You have parasympathetic dominance. It's physiologically impossible for you to have stress while those muscles of the pelvis are relaxed. You cannot do it. I've taught this to well over 100,000 people, and I teach them that, and the looks I get back from them is this. Um, I'm going to ask you to do it one more time, just completely soften those muscles of the pelvis, just completely let them go. And while you are releasing the muscles of your pelvis, notice what you happen what's happening in the rest of your body as you release the muscles of your pelvis. What do you notice happening in your shoulders and in your feet and in your thighs and in your hands? And what most of you will have noticed is that while you are completely softening the muscles of your pelvis, you're finding that the rest of your body is systemically, the whole system is letting go. And that's the only group of muscles in the, in the human body that do that, is that you get total systemic relaxation with releasing the muscles of the pelvis. Why? Because you're, you're, you're no longer squeezing the vagus nerve, and the vagus nerve is, when you're squeezing the muscles around the vagus nerve, it's sending an afferent message back to the brain that there's danger, and it keeps the threat response entropic and on. Um, release the muscles, whoo, the message back to the brain is that there's no danger, so it interrupts the threat response. It's how they teach agents to beat polygraph tests. Added value for this course, no extra charge if you ever need to beat one of those. Just keep your, your pelvic relaxed because that's what a polygraph test measures is sympathetic activation. And you see that when you're lying, if you're, uh, that's subcortical, you're perceiving the threat, so it's happening unconscious and you can't consciously, by an act of will, stop it. You can't constrict to stop it. But if you do keep the muscles of the pelvis relaxed, you can't have a threat response. So you don't activate the machine. Isn't that That's intriguing. It's intriguing for me. Um, so that is the skill that I teach everybody. Um, you know, sometimes folks say, well, what about people that have histories of, of sexual abuse? Isn't that, isn't that disrespectful? And I'll say, Shh, is it not teaching them that self-disrespect? You know, and the way I do it is I say, are you interested in reclaiming that area of your body back as your own? And if they say yes, I teach them. If they say no, I say, then I don't push it. That helping somebody who is a survivor of sexual violence to be in a relaxed pelvis is that helping them to heal the trauma of the past where they are no longer living as a victim of it. It is regaining ownership, control, and repatriating a part of their body that has been dissociated and disowned because of how much pain there is there. Mm, I just think it's absolutely essential to teach survivors of sexual violence uh, how to release the tension in those muscles. So these are the skills that I teach, the common ones that I teach to my clients. And we get to the end of the session and 90%, nine, no more than that, 95% of my clients 
Um, we have found a moment where they're saying, yeah, that feels good. And I say, okay, memorize that. That's what I'm going to ask you to go repeat multiple times over the next week and come back and report on how that was for me. But a small per percent, five, eight percent of my clients, maybe not eight, closer to five, um, get to the end of the session and they say, bro, I ain't feeling it. And those are folks usually with high A scores that have been in a constricted body for, for a lot of years. And what I got to do with them is I got to help them reference the muscles so that they can find it and then, and then release it. So how do I do that? I do that with Jacobsian relaxation. <laughs> I, I say to them, where, where do you hold tension in your body? Are you aware of, where, <coughs> of what muscles in your body hold tension? And for a lot of people, it's the shoulders, it's the traps that I feel, you know, uh, my shoulders up around my ears. And I say, okay, here's what I'm going to ask you to do is for five seconds, I want you to tighten up those muscles as tight as you can uh, around those muscles in your shoulders, your trapezius muscles. And one, two, three, four, five. Now release. Can you tell the difference between tension and now relaxation? And everybody always says, yeah, it's different. Okay, cool. Well, what I'm going to ask you to do for today and tomorrow and maybe even the third day, um, what you might need to do is tighten first and then release, five seconds of tightening and then releasing. But what you'll see by the third day is that you won't need to tighten first. You will have developed uh, so much awareness of that muscle that you'll become so familiar with it that you'll be able to just notice that it's constricted and you'll just be able to put your attention on it. And having memorized what you're doing to relax it, you'll just be able to, to release it. That's called Jacobsian relaxation, tightening of it first. And so then I use that principle to teach everybody um, using Jacobsian relaxation with the pubococcyx muscle. What's that called? That's called a Kegel exercise. I say, you don't need to tell anybody that you're doing this. Um, but what I'm going to ask you to do is for five seconds, think about if you were mid-urination and you wanted to stop, the muscle that you would have to constrict to do that. Tighten that muscle up as tight as you can for five seconds right now. One, two, three, four, five, and then release. And then take a nice deep breath. And on the exhale, release that muscle as profoundly as you can. Now, memorize that sensation in your body right now. That is pelvic floor relaxation. Now, as I said, with the shoulders, you may need to tighten that first and then release it for the next day or two. But by the third day, you're just going to be able to put your attention on that area of your body, realize that it's constricted, and release it. So whether or not you are aware of it, you are now have all the knowledge that you need. And I said you were going to leave, complete this to training today, knowing how to never experience stress again for the rest of your lives. I have delivered that to you. If you were here in the, in the room, I would say, how many of you are leaving today's training knowing how to never experience stress again for the rest of your lives? And you would reluctantly raise your hand. For, and I, then I say, for anybody who is not, who does not, is not clear on that, let me direct your attention to the question up on the screen. Who is squeezing the muscles in your body? Not your spouse, not your boss, not the person in the, uh, behind the wheel of the big truck. Um, that would be you who is squeezing the muscles in your body. Um, and are you enjoying that squeezing? Because if you are, I want to invite you to keep squeezing. As long as it's uh, pleasant for you, then by all means, squeeze away. But when it is no longer pleasant, when you are no longer enjoying the squeezing, then I'd like to invite you to stop. Now, that's so simple, it's almost snark. It's not meant to be. It is meant to belie the understanding that even though it's taken some of you watching this decades for you to get that good at squeezing. With a few days, no matter how long, no matter what your trauma history, with a few days of concerted practice, 
anybody alive can learn to stop squeezing and develop a disciplined way of living that you are interrupting that squeezing more and more and more and more and more. And when you do that, you are no longer suffering from the events of your past and you are having quality of life here in the present. That is skill number one. Now we're going to move on to skill number two, which is intentionality. 